I picked Alabama to beat LSU all week. Uh, Alabama was a two and a half point road favorite. And I said, look, I am terrified of this LSU defensive line against Jalen Milrose legs. You can tell me that LSU's defense has been improved, which it has been since last year, which is like doesn't really mean a lot because the defense was terrible last year. There was really no direction to go but up. I picked Alabama all week long. I didn't expect it to be this bad. Like, I did not expect it to be a butt whipping in a 42 to 6 form at, at Tiger Stadium. And it's not even the defense because this defense was never going to win football games for LSU fits. It's LSU's ineptitude offensively in the red zone, bad turnovers from Garrett Nussmeyer in the end zone in this game, struggle to run the football. It's the offense that was supposed to win games for LSU and it was the offense that was horrendous <laughs> against an Alabama defense that frankly has been average this season. I, I came into this game and I wanted to try a different watch approach. I, I wanted to watch both of these quarterbacks like I had no preconceived notions and I'd never watched either of them play a snap before in my life because you know our own Nate Tice is very high on us. Meyer keeps telling mm -hmm. Everybody that he might be the number one quarterback in this year's draft to him. A lot of people like Nussmeyer. So I said, you know what? I'm going to come into this and I'm going to I'm going to play it blind. And the funny thing is I played this blind and what I saw from Jalen Milrow was, uh, you know, legs, obviously, that can make anything happen. Very, uh, the, the capability to force a defender to make a decision on what they're doing and then be able to, to throw the ball around him. Like it was a precision game from Jalen Milrow. And I just sat there and thought, wow, this kid, I don't know if he looks like a natural NFL quarterback to me, but boy, like the way he's playing, you, you can see it. You can see the spark. And then Nussmeyer gets the ball and I'm like, all right. Show me what you got, kid. I am ready to watch this. And I kept thinking, Caroline, you can appreciate this because you and I stood together when we were both working for ESPN. We stood on the sidelines, and I watched Joe Burrow. And I remember when I was talking to all of our college football analysts for Joe Burrow at the SEC championship game, I looked over at one of our analysts, and I said, somebody tell me why we do not talk about Joe Burrow the way that we talked about Peyton Manning or Andrew Luck when they came out of college because that's what it looks like to me. It looks like a can't-miss prospect. And I remember Orlovsky and a few other people said, no, he is that. We just haven't caught up yet. So I come in with that in my mind of what an LSU quarterback can look like when they are great. And I watched Nussmeyer just be absolute captain mediocrity. That's the only way to describe it. And Mediocrity time, is a compliment. Well, every time to be fair. <laughs> he tried to get them back in the game, every time they tried to let him get them back in the game, the backbreaking interception at the second half to start on that drive in the end zone, I just looked at him and thought, how in the hell can we be talking about this kid and what he can do on Sundays when he doesn't look right now like he can read a defense on Saturdays? Adam, like, I thought Nussmeyer was yeah. absolutely just a huge part of why, why LSU lost this game and a massive disappointment in the way he played. Yeah, Nussmeyer's worst play in this game was the interception on second and goal from the four-yard line. You cannot turn the football over in that situation. LSU was, was still in the game at that point. It was a ball game, and, and Nussmeyer was was terrible. And it really, it, it comes down to what I thought was really bad play calling on the goal line multiple times by LSU. First first drive of the game, uh, LSU had first and goal from the six. And when that when this when this uh, series of plays played out, I was like, this is gonna be a long game for LSU. Very first play, first down on the six yard line. They they run a play action. Uh, in rollout, it's a one-man route. Nussmeyer sails it out of the back of the end zone. Now second down, they don't get the play call in, call a timeout. They look disorganized. Nussmeyer is looking at the sideline, not knowing what's going on. Then they run the ball on second down. At that point, you don't run the ball on second down because you're on the six-yard line. You're going to get if you get stuffed, you now got third down, one play, and you could get a field goal. So once you run play action, first play, you got to throw with the two other downs on the six-yard line. Uh, so they run the ball, get stuffed. Now it's third and six on the six-yard line, run a hitch route. And it's incomplete, kick a field goal. And at that point, I was like, man, bad start to the game, unorganized in the red zone on the goal line where you can't be unorganized. You should never be unorganized on the six-yard line. And Garrett Nussmeyer didn't complete any passes, was making the wrong reads, and sailed two balls out of the back of the end zone. So that that was the start to the game when that happened. And then the other goal line out play, the goal line drive when Nussmeyer threw the pick, that combination was oh, why LSU lost the game. They, they, they were in the game on those two goal line plays. Well, and that first drive that you were just talking about at the, the Alabama six-yard line. So, Caden Durham, young freshman running back for yeah. LSU, he got them in the red zone on a massive 45-yard pickup on the ground. You're in the red zone. 
You're running the football on, I believe it was, let me pull up the box score here. It's second and goal at the Alabama five. And Josh yeah. Williams is carrying the football. Josh Williams is a six-year vet at LSU. But what the hell is he doing carrying the yeah. football with Caden Durham on the bench when he has been the most explosive runner on that football team, not just on Saturday night against Alabama, but the entire season? Like that has been some uh, something I've questioned in terms of play calling. That was what we saw all night long in the red zone. Whenever they ran it in the red zone, it was not with Caden Durham. Have your best players on the field in your most critical moments always. It is a great point. And my question though is why are they running the ball there on second and six when they when they threw an incomplete pass on first down? If you're gonna run the ball, run it on first down. And then you yeah. got two downs to throw the football and try to get in the end zone. I hate right. the reverse. The reverse play call there of play action first down, then running it on second down. It makes no sense. And it put their ultimately puts us Nussmeyer in a bad spot as well. On third down with drop back, everyone know everyone knows he's throwing it on third down, puts your quarterback in a bad spot. Yeah, and uh, part of this is you knew you were gonna have to go blow to blow with Jalen. Like I, I you had yeah. to know coming into it that their strengths, and this is just sometimes life. Like like in the NBA, sometimes matchups make series. And the better team doesn't win, the matchups win, right? You had to know coming into this game that the matchup, your weakness on the defensive side of the ball of your LSU is, man, people can run all over you, and you know that. And now you're taking on a running quarterback that truly is gifted with his legs and yeah. has a second gear that you're not ready for. Like You had to know that you were going to score a bunch of points. You had to have a better game plan for red zone offense, particularly coming in, because you know that those trips have to result in touchdowns. The, there is a star being born in college football right now in the coaching world, and it's Nick Sherrod at Alabama's offensive coordinator. Because you want to see how an offense is supposed to perform in the red zone and how they're supposed to use their playmakers. It's what Alabama did in this game. The way Nick Sheridan schemes up the run game for Jalen Milrow is a piece of art. And everyone knows Jalen Milrow is going to run the football. But what he does, every almost every time Jalen Milrow runs the football, it's not what we normally see quarterback run game look like in college football, where it's zone read, quarterback pulls it, and the quarterback's out on the edge by themselves. Almost every time, they're in what, what I call, what football coaches call the plus one run game, where they have the running back, lead blocking for the quarterback so the quarterback then can can have a two-way go following that running back. So even if they do the zone read, so they'll fake the handoff to the running back, the running back peels off aware of that fake and then goes and be, becomes a lead blocker for Jalen Monroe. So that gives you an extra hat. Normally, the quarterback hand, hands the ball off and he just watches the play. Now with that running back, you have the extra blocker. And that's what they've done so well on for Alabama's offense. And Nick Sheridan has so many different formations, so many different looks. And then the best part of Nick Sheridan and his game calling calling plays, he has such good feel of when to call shots. In this game, after the game got delayed, when LSU fans threw the bottles on the field, to come back with the reverse to Ryan Williams right after that happens – unreal feel as a play caller when a lot of play callers would just hand off inside zone to get their guys back into the game he calls the reverse it's an explosive explosive play to ryan williams so i'm a big nick sheridan fan if you can't tell i think he's done a really good job and bama he's got got that offense role and jim milro now probably right back in, in the heisman favorite odds i mean he, he, if alabama keeps playing well uh, uh, milro's up there in the heisman conversation it was, it's it was always pretty... the game against LSU where Jalen <laughs> Milrow's Heisman Trophy odds skyrocket. I mean, like, in the last two years, Jalen Milrow has run into the end zone, I think, maybe 37,000 times <laughs> against LSU. It was last year in Tuscaloosa where it was like, is anybody, anybody... Anybody in a white uniform maybe want to just spy this guy, and it was the exact same thing today. And everything that you said is brilliant, but it's almost like I don't even want to give Nick Sheridan credit because to have a talent like Jalen Milrow and be as explosive as he is, it's almost like, well, you know, I could probably draw those things up because Jalen Milrow is such a talent. And I'm yeah. joking. I'm joking because uh, Nick Sheridan could. did a you fantastic could. job on Saturday, think, but he's yeah. just so good that it's like, yeah. you don't really need a mastermind to be drawing yeah. anything up like that. He just is so explosive or at least can be because he hasn't been consistently this season. But he was today, not just explosive. He was patient which was mm -hmm. really cool to see. Like, there were several runs that he got into the line of scrimmage. He waited until whoever was trying to spy him committed. Then he just outran him. 
Like, I, I think that's the, the zero to 60 sort of Porsche effect of Jalen Milrow was really on display today. But I, I just thought his patience in letting everything develop in front of him, letting those blocks get around him, and then, bam, exploding out was like, that, that was brilliant. I don't know how you stop that. And uh, that's one of those things. I heard an NFL analyst the other day talking about how there are certain players, no matter how many times you see them on tape, when you get on field with them, you're like, oh, I got this. And then you suddenly realize you don't got this. I think that's what happened here. Like, they, they're looking at it. They're like, I got Milrow. I understand what to do. And then all of a sudden, he takes off. You're like, up, oh, up, oh, up. Oh. That is faster than I thought. Like, that's just happening over and over and over again. Yeah. And this is like a an existential crisis kind of time for the LSU fan base. Because yeah. this was just so perfect that this game went the way that it did with the stakes that this game had. It was so perfect that Alabama and LSU were playing for an opportunity to get to the college football playoff. Because that's what Alabama and LSU games have been for since Nick Saban left to LSU. It's been LSU and Alabama, and the winner of that game advances to Atlanta to get to the SEC championship game and will probably find themselves in the national championship game. And more often than not, Pretty much every single time, LSU was on the losing end of it. So LSU fans have felt like since Nick Saban got to Alabama, Alabama was the one thing standing in the way between LSU and what they wanted to achieve. Yeah. Obviously, the 2011 National Championship game, LSU beats them in the regular season. Alabama wins the National Championship. 2015, there's a massive Heisman battle between Derrick Henry and Leonard Fournette. And it was all going to come down to that game and Brian Denny. And I think Leonard Fournette ran for like three yards in that game. So Leonard Fournette's Heisman odds died against Alabama. And then every single year, when LSU LSU wants to get to Atlanta and beats Florida and Texas A&M and Ole Miss in the process. They fall short because of Alabama and Nick Saban retiring felt like this cathartic experience for the LSU fan base because finally the you know proverbial wicked witch was dead. Finally, Alabama is no longer standing in LSU's way of getting to the SEC championship game, of getting to the college football playoff. Year one, Kalen DeBoer, what does he do? He comes in and he just pees all over LSU's expectations. Expectations, and LSU is not getting to the college football playoff. And LSU very well could be nine and three for the third year in a row for its third year under Brian Kelly. And it is it just feels like this is an, a, a questioning, an existential crisis for this fan base, because it's like, who are we? Is this who we just are? It wasn't Nick Saban all along. We just really are Alabama's little brother. And that's a tough thing to swallow.